the topic of progressive leadership in the digital age. Leadership is something that we all do, right? No matter what your rank is, no matter what your title is. But particularly, leadership in the digital age requires us to think differently, act differently, but more importantly, take on new responsibilities. We don't live in a transactional model anymore. The digital transformation has forced us into an ecosystem model where we have to think about many stakeholders. So it becomes even more imperative for us to be mindful of the decisions we make and the downstream impact that those decisions have on all of our stakeholders. The world is um, very volatile. We know that um, climate-related disasters are everywhere. We talked about it just now, about climate change. We know the spread of disease, infectious disease. We know there's pollution. We know there are a lot of issues in the world, and so do our customers. They also know that those things are happening, and they expect to see leadership in the products they buy and the services that they um, purchase. So it's important for us to know that it's really not just about profit anymore. Just like Anna was saying, it's about profit people and our planet. We have to take all of that into account. So I think the, the digital leader or the leader in a digital world has those additional responsibilities. We do live in a volatile time and our history, but technology, um, the history of technology couldn't have been better for us now. And mobile has been in the forefront of that technology revolution. We just heard that there are five billion people who own mobile devices around the world, and it's expected to be, expected to have tw 25 billion devices, connected devices by 2025. That's a lot of devices and a lot of connectivity. Did you know that, I found this out, that every day those five billion users of mobile devices are generating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. I had to look up quintillion, has 18 zeros in front of it. I mean, I can't even imagine how big that number is, but that's every day. And if you think about the vast reach of mobile, the data that it produces, and then mashing that up with publicly available data and third-party data, you can now really, really drive insights that are rich and timely to tackle real business problems, real social problems, and have true impact. I mean, I think as a technologist, for me, this is an incredible time to be alive, even though we have so many issues and so many social challenges globally, we have the tools to make it right. And as Alex mentioned earlier, uh, PwC um, just released yesterday a report in collaboration with the GSMA on mobile big data and the impact on a better future. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about what that report um, is going to um, include, and I hope that every one of you take it back to your companies and use it as your companion guide for um, reaching the UN SDGs um, in 2030. So the report basically highlights opportunities that mobile big data brings for social good. It also has use cases of real examples where digital innovation made an impact. And we'll hear about some of those use cases from our panelists. And last but not least, it has a framework for execution, which I think is really important. And we developed that framework by looking at the UN, the 17 UN SDGs, and determining which ones were susceptible to mobile disruption. Then we talked to the mobile operators and really understood what their initiatives were about and created the framework to enhance and uplift the efficiency of those initiatives. So it is a companion guide for achieving a lot of those goals. So I hope you take a, a, take a look at it. 
before we have the panelists come up and share those use cases with us and just their thoughts about um, what they've done in their organizations and what they're about to do in their organizations, I wanted to just prompt you to think about three things that I think about as I try to be a progressive leader in this digital age. One is collaboration. Because we don't live in a transactional world anymore, we live in an ecosystem, you have to think about different ways of working. You have to balance the needs and benefits and desires of a lot of stakeholders to bring it all together. And that requires mindfulness and talent and, and intentionality. Two is scale. Anything that you design and build and develop should be done with the, with the intent of expansion. So it has to be replicable, it has to be repeatable, it has to be extensible. Otherwise, you create silos and you stunt your growth. So go big or go home. And lastly, but definitely not least, ethics. You have to, in the digital world, we have to put ethics at the forefront of our guiding principles. Responsible use of data has to be the cornerstone of any principle and any initiative that you have. Customers, if they lose the trust that they have in us in safeguarding their data, they will not be our customers anymore. We will lose them. So I think this is an important point that I will drive home again and again, and I gave a panel discussion about it yesterday, and I think it's uh, an important point that we forget to infuse our principles with. So I think it's time for us to invite our panelists to stage and hear about digital innovations by real leaders and, their, and hear about their real use cases. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. And I've prepared some questions, but I think there's enough information to go around that we can have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask your questions as well. So before we get started, let's do an introduction. Should we start with Masaki? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Masaki Koga uh, from KDDI Japan. KDDI is uh, the second biggest uh, uh, telecommunication operators in Japan. And uh, uh, now KDDI is uh, uh, growing uh, every year. And uh, the reason we achieved the, the uh, growth is uh, the, uh, the expansion of uh, non-telecommunication businesses. So we started uh, with uh, the digital content, but now uh, uh, we are uh, 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 using uh, uh, the uh, e-commerce, and uh, we are uh, also selling uh, uh, physical products such as uh, water and uh, uh, rice, and uh, financial service and uh, 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 insurance. And uh, uh, recently, we uh, started uh, 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 electricity reserve and uh, 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 gas. So such kind of a uh, business, uh, we call uh, those services as uh, life design businesses because uh, it's uh, very, very uh, uh, important uh, for uh, everybody's life. So now uh, our uh, business is starting from uh, telecommunication, but uh, now uh, 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 the uh, company uh, which is uh, uh, taking care of uh, uh, every person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Heather Johnson, and I'm leading Ericsson's sustainability and corporate responsibility uh, efforts uh, globally. And I would just, you know, mention Ericsson began as, uh, or our founder really began the company on the premise that communication was a basic human need and should be available for all. And I think, you know, going back to your leadership introduction, I mean, to really sort of make that intentional decision that it was going to be a benefit for the masses. Um, last year, we, we re-articulated our company purpose to empowering an intelligent, sustainable, and connected world. 
And if we put that in the SDG context or the global goals, we really think that it's about twinning technology leadership with partnership for progress. And that that you know, combined strength is what we can help to deliver uh, to the industry. So I'll be delighted to share some uh, thoughts on that on the panel. Excellent, thank you. Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda Gardner. Um, I'm the Director of Social Responsibility at Verizon. I am relatively new to Verizon, um, and I joined in about May of, was it May? May this year. Um, joined for three reasons. I am absolutely thrilled about the potential for technology to solve global challenges, and joining a company like Verizon um, with its resources, with its scale and scope, uh, the ability to do so many things in this space was just a pull that I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Um, we also have a CEO who um, believes in social responsibility as a core component of business and who understands the significance of the sustainable development goals and the responsibility that business has to, to drive them. Um, and to work for someone like that who has the potential to drive top-down leadership on that agenda is like gold dust to a sustainability or a sustainable business professional. So here I am, um, and my, my role is really to drive our new uh, sustainable business strategy, uh, crossing over social responsibility and environmental responsibility, and, and to then integrate that down into the different parts of the business. Well, Verizon is lucky to have you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Joan. I'm Joan Krajewski, president and founder of One Planet LLC. Um, this is actually my first presentation. Is one LLC, I formerly was with um, Microsoft uh, most recently, and um, my consultancy um, basically helps businesses bridge to being more sustainable. I'm super excited to be part of this panel um, because I think as we go through our digital transformation today in our Industry 4.0, we're undergoing another transformation um, towards um, being more sustainable, and it's really uh, important that uh, businesses lead uh, to make sustainability a core part of their operations. Thank you. Now, I prepared some questions to ask you individually, but there's one question that I'd like to ask all of you. So if you could each respond to that question. Why is doing good good for business and how do you balance the business imperatives of revenue and profitability with social imperatives? So let's start with Joan and we'll go this way. Great, thank you. Well, the metadata indicates, as was earlier discussed, that um, businesses who invest in social and environmental programs actually do perform better. And studies have shown this time and time again over the past several years. Um, but beyond performance, I actually think that having, being leaders in this area is essential to business sustainability, and I mean economic sustainability and long, longer term value. And there are many converging um, reasons for this. Basically, when you look at businesses in terms of risk and disruption, um, the World Economic Forum indicates the top two Risks are extreme climate events and also um, business disruption in terms of mitigation and adaptation. So risk is a huge area. Another area to look at is where we're going in terms of employment. In a few short years, millennials are going to be a core part of the employee population. And as many of you know, uh, being that you're in digital technology, the um, competition for the right employees is fierce, you know. And these millennial employees care about social and environmental issues. And there have been many studies done about the millennial employment population. One, they want to work for companies that have real programs around these issues. Two, they're very sophisticated. Three, they tend to move and jump jobs more often than other populations. Four, they're willing to accept lower pay to work for a company that um, actually has core programs around these issues. They, they talk with their pocketbook. They're willing to spend money on these issues. So, and also <coughs> to even make investments and accept lower returns to support 
um, these issues. All of these things are very important to our companies. You want the biggest, you want, we want the best employees, we want the biggest investors, um, you know, the biggest funds, and um, you know, so this is important to our longevity. And um, so if you want to be longev have this longevity, if you want to have sustainability as a company, then you really have to do this as part of your core performance indicators. Thank you. Amanda? Sure. So I don't, I don't see the dichotomy between profit and purpose to be that much of a dichotomy. I think businesses are built and they exist to solve social problems. That's how things get invented. Um, entrepreneurs see a void and they try to fill it. And I think what we need to be careful of is that the unintended, comp the unintended consequences of how we do business are managed carefully and we evolve as businesses um, to take advantage of new opportunities. We can't succeed in societies that fail. We need skilled workforces. Um, we need customers who can afford to pay for our products. We need communities that aren't in conflict, that are healthy, um, where we have our factories. And so making sure we're mitigating some of the risks of our operations in those contexts is really critically important, but also innovating um, in those spaces um, to think about new markets, to think about how we actually um, solve societal challenges and see them as innovation opportunities is equally as important. I would say more than ever before, business is expected to play a role. The SDGs explicitly call out business. Um, investors are asking us more about ESG, invest, ESG investors and regular investors. Larry Fink of BlackRock in his famous letter calling on companies to think about stakeholders beyond just shareholders. Um, we're being asked to think more broadly. And so no business can really afford not to think about this anymore. Um, and I think the SDGs provide a really big opportunity for us to do more around innovation in partnership with others. Great, thank you. Um, so I think it's going to be a bit of a chorus here yeah, on the, on the stage it's good. because I think we're we're all building along the same along the same storylines. And I just reflect on uh, the op-ed that Mark Benioff wrote mm -hmm. uh, a week or so yes. ago in the New York Times, and uh, he really posited and really building on on what you said, Amanda that um, it's, it's a false choice to say it's doing good or it's doing business. And really, it is the intersectionality that will be really, for long-term successful businesses, that must be the approach. And I think it's, um, it's something that I would say we can really see across sort of the spectrum of stakeholders, whether it's employees. I mean, there's really a groundswell. I know we, we often give the millennial uh, figures, but I would sort of put forward that most people of any age want to work for a company that is delivering value to society and being part of that solution. And, um, and certainly investors we see. I mean, a few years ago, there was a very niche SRI, socially responsible investors. Now, basically, every mainstream investor considers themselves some kind of a responsible investment uh, you know, Fund. And so I just think that we are seeing this transformation across and this pull for companies, as you say, to, to we are expected to be part of and really an integral uh, player in, uh, in development of, uh, of the world. Thank you. Masaki. I, uh, as I said before, KDDI have been expanding our businesses and uh, uh, one uh, uh, example is uh, financial service. KDDI uh, uh, established a bank uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, and then, uh, that bank is an online bank. So uh, uh, customers uh, don't need to go to the bank. And so uh, that bank uh, uh, is very, very uh, uh, handy and uh, useful, but uh, if uh, 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 something happened, such as uh, the big disaster and so on, and the uh, telecommunication service uh, was uh, uh, um, stopped. But then uh, the bank service also uh, stopped. So that, 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 that is one example. So uh, uh, if uh, we stop 
the, our uh, telecommunication services, then uh, uh, our lifeline also be uh, stopped. So that's why uh, so our telecommunication operators uh, have a lot of responsibility. So that is uh, the current situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So speaking of connectivity, I'm going to put another question to Joan. Um, connectivity has been one of the most transformative technologies that have really had an impact on everybody's lives. How do you think that played a role in sustainable leadership and responsible leadership? Well, I totally agree with what you're saying, that connectivity is key. Um, coming from a technology background, I know that um, technology is key to solving some of the most pressing problems that we have in the world today. Um, one of them being climate change, where as the video said, we're basically on the precipice of an abyss. I believe that in my heart to be true. Yeah. And it is this connectivity that bridges us to other digital technologies that are enabled by mobility, um, including Internet of Things, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, um, quantum computing. None of these technologies will be able to work at scope and scale and complexity without the benefit of mobile technology. And in fact, in terms of responsible businesses, if we hope to use, be able to use these tools, we must have mobile um, technology, and not only for our businesses, but our constituencies and climate, uh, our customers and stakeholders have to have this technology too in order to address, as we mentioned before, the SDGs. I'll just name a couple of examples, if I may, with respect to education. We need educated workers. Um, you know, studies have shown that when um, different communities have access to um, mobile t uh, connectivity, that the GPA within one year actually raises by one whole point. You know, and so, um, and this adds to our communities, it adds to our customers, it adds to us, it gives them access to this plethora of other technologies that we have. And so I think it's incumbent upon responsible business leaders to look at sustainability holistically and to recognize how key it is that mobile technology is accessible to everyone. Thank you. Heather, can you tell us um, a little bit about the climate change and the um, fighting the inequalities that your company has been engaged in? And just to refresh everybody's mind who may not know about it. Absolutely, delighted to. I think just to maybe set the context, I mean, we are a technology company as, uh, as we all are on this panel. And uh, so we really ground the work we do first in research and development to understand sort of the impacts that both we are creating or that we can you know, have, uh, inter make interventions upon. And uh, so it's really based on that science and facts and, uh, and understanding that allows us to really look at uh, ways to, to, to take concrete action. And I'll just give you, I think uh, the climate example is a very good one because we can really see a thread sort of throughout. Uh, we've done two decades of life cycle assessments. We were one of the first companies to use uh, life cycle assessments as an environmental tool. And I think that has informed us. We know that our products in use, that is the products that we sell to mobile operators, is the largest impact. So of course, from that research uh, perspective, we put our focus into how do we create the most energy efficient portfolio so that I'm delighted to see the Vodafone example on the climate uh, film because of course that's one of our customers where we were really able to help them make a 30% reduction in their uh, in their networks in, in the UK. And so that was, of course, a stakeholder I didn't mention, uh, but customers, of course, really driving that need because 
energy uh, use is, of course, one of the biggest OPEX uh, for a mobile operator. So it is, again, twinning that sort of profit or uh, economics and purpose that really can drive uh, how we make decisions. And I'll just share one, uh, one further example, sort of thinking about sort of we, we thought about uh, expanding to societal impact. And we have a very exciting program that's been going on for a number of years. It's also featured by the GSMA in their Case for Change campaign, and uh, it's Connected Mangroves. And this, we really started again, sort of thinking about that same thing. We started to look at the problem. What is the issue? Mangroves are considered the rainforest of the sea, and they are, over the past uh, decades, they have been reduced by 50%. This, <laughs> just devastates the ecosystem, both sort of for the, the natural environment, but also for the populations, the fishermen. Yeah. And so we've done an intervention. It's looking at how, uh, together with customers in the Philippines and Malaysia, we are both not only replanting, but also using IoT and sensor technology to understand what were the issues that created that devastation, and how can we make interventions to uh, to, to change that, and I just, it's exciting to see that, you know, a few years ago, employees were there uh, planting saplings, and those are now six feet tall. Oh. So it's, it's really just a lovely, you know, example of how we can sort of pull the thread throughout the entire operations. That's fantastic. I, I, I'm hoping that as you have um, more interaction and more partnership with your customers, <laughs> that um, that you can transmit some of that inspiration Absolutely. to them and Absolutely. get into more partnerships with them. Um, but at Verizon, you were um, one of the signatories of the digital declaration. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is, what it means to your organization, and what the customers should expect of yours? Yeah, so, the, so the digital declaration was launched at Davos in um, January at the World Economic Forum, and some of the biggest names in technology have signed up. Um, and what it really does is kind of set out some big aspirations for the, the digital future that center around consumer trust, that center around making sure we have the right um, environment for innovating in technology, and also thinking about inclusive growth and opportunities for all. Um, why did we sign? So we know that technology enables so many positive things in health, in education, in, um, in finance, but we also know that technology on its own is not a panacea and that if we don't innovate responsibly, if we don't build principles of responsible innovation into what we're doing, um, we can also have some unintended negative consequences. So you know, a number of incidents over the years uh, have laid some truth to that. Um, the Adam and Trust Barometer, this year, I think, said that trust in business is now at 56%, which is not great. <laughs> um, and so we, we, we signed because we think it's important to be accountable for the impacts that our industry has. And quite frankly, because also it's a mechanism to crowd in other companies that believe that as well, and to think about how we make a journey uh, together toward responsible innovation. You know, no single company is, is really gonna change the world. We have to act in partnership, so I think this digital declaration provides a foundation, perhaps even for developing some principles of responsible design in this sector. Um, you know, we talk about inclusive design, we talk about design for accessibility, we design for all sorts of different things, but we don't really have a, a clear mechanism. Uh, we're all doing that in silos as companies. Maybe this is the opportunity to do that together. It's interesting because we're often thinking about how do you put these ethical frameworks in place? Mm -hmm. And in the absence of having an agreed upon standard, it's very difficult to have us move in unison. Everyone, to your point, is doing it separately and in their silos. And I think that's why it's really important when I was introducing the panel that we do design for scale. Because if we don't design for scale, then it is siloed and it is stunted. So I think that's a, that's a, it's a very important point. And the trust of your customers, you don't have that, you have no business. Right. <laughs> um, back to something else um, that we talked about, which was collaboration and the ecosystem of stakeholders. I wanted to pose this question to Masaki. 
Can you tell us about the partnership that you made with the Japan government and Toyota and any lessons learned, best practices that came from that? It's difficult to operate in this world where you can't do things by yourself, to Amanda and Heather's points earlier, and you have to form these partnerships, but sometimes their purpose is different than yours and they have different metrics for their success. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience and how you made that work? I see. So Japan, a uh, lot of uh, uh, natural uh, disasters. So this year, uh, several typhoons uh, hit and a uh, lot of uh, uh, damages. And uh, so uh, Japanese government uh, uh, see our uh, telecommunication operators very important. And uh, uh, we operators have uh, agreement with the uh, uh, Japanese government. And if a uh, uh, big disaster happened, uh, we provide uh, our resources, uh, such as uh, telecommunication uh, services and uh, uh, the uh, devices and so on. So uh, uh, the, our role is to help uh, the government uh, from a uh, telecommunication uh, point of view. And uh, uh, the uh, partnership uh, uh, with uh, Toyota uh, is uh, about the big data. And uh, uh, so KDDI uh, telecommunication operator have a lot of uh, uh, big data through telecommunication. And the Toyota Motor have a lot of data from cars. And uh, so uh, every car uh, sent uh, the, the, the traffic uh, information or the road damage information and uh, so on. And uh, one more uh, Japanese com company uh, uh, participated. And that company had uh, have a lot of uh, sensor data, such as uh, the condition of a bridge or uh, such kind of uh, infrastructures. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, tried to uh, mash up uh, all the uh, data. Then uh, we, we could uh, found out, uh, find out uh, the uh, new possibility. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, very, very, uh, uh, we found it's very, very useful, especially for the the disaster case. In the disaster case, uh, uh, people are uh, uh, very, very uh, in the trouble, so they need such kind of uh, uh, data. So we uh, found out it's very, very useful for uh, the Japanese citizen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and we talked about that, mashing up the data from your mobile um, usage, from other publicly available data, or from private data, in, in this case, um, Toyota, and how that really enriches the insights that you can find and enables services and products that, that are helpful and solve big problems. I have a question for Joan. Um, change management, I mean, you're a consultant and you're helping companies, you're helping people like us um, drive change through our organizations. We always underestimate, I'm a technologist building big enterprise technology tools and everybody forgets about change management. And as a technologist, I've done it enough to know that <laughs> without change management, you can't really have a successful initiative. So can you tell us a little bit about some best practices, some learnings, educate us a little bit? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because Sometimes these initiatives and declarations can go really wrong and um, they can get derailed. Yep. And sometimes in big companies when things are derailed, it can be derailed for 10 years or more. It's amazing. So um, I had some, made some notes on this because it's a really important issue in the context of what we're discussing. So first of all, when these declarations appear, within companies, no one wants to get caught by surprise. And there is um, a way to go about it inside companies. Um, every company has a different culture. But best is that you tell the rank and file in key middle management first, right? 
and, and, and explain to them the rationale and you know, the why, and we're backed up by scientific data uh, that you have, and even prepare for them the presentation that they will make to their management and give them the collateral that they need. And second, is it's really important to have a strong executive sponsor who can also talk peer to peer. So the, normally the way I would manage, orchestrate this, because it is an orchestration that needs to be done carefully, mm -hmm. is to have the rank and file, talk about the presentation and provide it to their management before your peer executive sponsor talks with the manager so that they know that they're on the same page. And, and to do this successfully, you really have to make sure you have the right stakeholders and you have to go through and make sure that you've closed all your gaps on everyone along the value chain that is going to have impact on implementation of this declaration. And there may be some surprise um, entities along the value chain that you may not think of, like PR mm -hmm. has to be part of it, marketing, legal, you know, and as well as those who are operational who are actually going to be rolling up their short sleeves and doing this, and all of those entities who will not, do not report up to you. These are all volunteers. You have to look at them as if they're a nonprofit volunteer, volunteer group, like the Red Cross. All volunteers, non-paid. Because in fact, when you have a big declaration, for most of these people, it's not part of their job to do this. And so that's part of the change and most people want to do good, as we've discussed on this panel, as people have adroitly stated, people want to support these initiatives. They want to do it, but it's an extra. So you have to give them the collateral and the exchange. And that includes understanding each and every stakeholder and the role that they play in these changes and what it means to them personally and how they're going to benefit from this change, whether I don't care what their motivation is. You have to understand their motivation. It could be their career. It could be that they want to do good. It could be that they want to have a message to give the company. It could be that marketing needs the sales collateral to talk with their business partners. But you have to understand their motivation and give them the collateral that they need to uh, make this a success. And so, um, you know, in relation to the strategy, you have to have a target. You have to operationally, you have to make sure that people understand the target really well. You, within the context of their own organizations, they have to have roadmaps on how they're going to help you get to that target. You have to have regular meetings so that people stay on task. And those meetings had better be good because, like I said, this is a voluntary organization that you're working with, not your typical corporate structure. And so if the meetings are good, people can get, disappear on you. We've all seen it happen. You and know, it's a very good point. I, I think the most salient point that I took out of this is the reminder that the people you're trying to activate, they are not incented naturally to do that. And you need to figure out how to incent them. I they think have day jobs. They have day jobs. Right. And, and, and sometimes, I mean, we live in a polarized world. I didn't want to bring elephants into the room, but we do. And sometimes people's beliefs aren't aligned with the belief system of the executive in charge or the, us who are trying to drive change. And that's also a hurdle to overcome, particularly today and in this climate. I agree. And when you work with the technology companies, data and science are key. You just have to have it. They're right. not going to go for the rah rah. That's right. Um, you know, cheering on. You need to have the the facts. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think those were really two really important points for all of us to remember. I'm going to pose a question to both Heather and Amanda. In terms of innovation in your organizations, how do you drive socially responsible innovation? How do you put that framework together and make that constraint? I know you made a really good point earlier about most entrepreneurs see a void in and try to fill it. So the impetus is always for good. But how do we 
how do we put the guardrails in place to make sure it doesn't go off the rails? Do you want to? I can. I can kick it, it off. off. Yeah. I mean, I, just to maybe also give a little bit of a perspective on how we're working across sort of the sustainable uh, sustainability spectrum. I mean, we start with I would say a foundation of responsible business, and that really can set. I mean, that that has to be in place first, and you know that can be everything from health and safety to responsible sourcing to. Um, you know, a number of things, but I think in this case, and, and to, to this point specifically, especially, especially about innovation and really making social impact, and a little bit touching on what Amanda said earlier, you have to understand, first of all, your impacts, but also how technology could be misused. And I think we have seen, uh, we have seen experience from some, if I say newer companies, since we're <laughs> over 140 years old, but that maybe that wasn't uh, always considered, yeah. that th there, was a much more, there was a much shorter term perspective. So I think sustainability is about the long term. It's good business for the long term, not good business to feel good or it is, you know, it is really this profit and purpose twinning together. But um, so I think that, you know, again, really basing it, you know, on the science, on the data, where do you make an impact, start there. Uh, and then also, really from the, the social perspective, start with the problem. Don't start with the technology looking for a problem. Because I think that's often, that's uh, very tempting. <laughs> when, and I think that that's, uh, you know, really, you know, starting with, uh, with those components in place, being responsible, understanding the unintended consequences or what misuse could, uh, could entail, mitigating those risks to really from the start, uh, and then starting with the problem, and uh, and often that means with you know people in focus, uh, I think is a winning formula. Thank you, Amanda. I would absolutely agree with that. I think how we innovate in these next ten years is going to be as important as what we innovate. Five G is clearly going to change the whole picture for health, for education, for all the rest of it, um, and there are multiple things and myriad ways that we can create all sorts of applications and innovations to ride on top of that technology. But if we don't start with people first, it's just going to be dumping technology on a problem. And so we really need to think about human-centered design, about design principles. Um, the GSMA's, I think it was called the Mobile for Impact Report, which was just mentioned at the front, talked about how um, solving digital inclusion barriers is going to enable the industry to impact even more on all of the SDGs. And so thinking about how we bring the other half of the world that's not currently online online is really critical. And doing that isn't going to look like the way we did it for the first half. It's going to be completely different. And so thinking really creatively about how we get into and understand new markets and the drivers and the barriers in those new markets is going to be something that's really uncomfortable for large companies, but we're going to have to just get better at. Um, and I think, again, doing that in partnership rather than planting a flag and saying Verizon did it or you know, Ericsson did it or Microsoft did it, whoever it is, really getting past some of the regulatory challenges, some of the competitive challenges in doing that collaboratively is going to be the future. And the companies that navigate that are, the, are going to be the winners. Could I add a little bit? Please, to please. If I may. Um, I think one of the issues about innovation that oftentimes technology companies um, don't think about is that human beings are amazingly creative. And so they will take the technology that um, companies invent and it's beautiful and you think you've gone through all of the different risk assessments and so on and so forth and then someone outside takes this technology and just all of a sudden does something completely different with it. I'll give you an example. Xbox controllers. Um, they're used to drive tanks now remotely. Mm -hmm. Whoever thought within the context of a video game console that the controller which is a beautiful piece of technology would be used that way. So I think another thing that the companies should do is to really watch minutely what is happening on the market with their technology and rapidly respond to it. 
because it's just going to be impossible to have 100% certainty that, that companies have thought of all the scenarios and to have like a rapid response team, you know, whose job it is to watch and respond and to react and to mitigate, you know, any issues that are kind of developing. In recent times, we've seen a lot of issues that have occurred. In my view, had some of the companies uh, responded quickly and taken, you know, every event seriously, that um, you know those companies would have been a lot better off today. I could give an example, but not about out, uh, any of the companies here. You know, I'm not, um, there were there were situations around um, sort of supply chains, for example, uh, where which we all have supply chains here. Um, every single one of us has an upstream and downstream supply chain. And oftentimes there are issues of the day where you know, companies may feel pressured by um, NGOs that are particularly um, passionate about their issues and want to um, do good. Um, and companies want to respond because we're consumer focused. Um, in one instance um, the, that I'll give to you is around conflict minerals, for example. Some companies felt really pressured not to, um, to, to use conflict minerals and to say that they didn't have conflict minerals in their supply chain. Why? Because in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, children are used in the mines and none of us want to use child labor or have child labor in our supply chains. You know, it's just, we don't want to do it. It's a non-negotiable. But what they didn't, these companies that said we no longer use conflict minerals, what they didn't take into account is as horrible as the use of child labor seems that these children needed to work to eat and to feed their families. And the only other options that these children had were to fight um, in these armies or to uh, prostitute themselves. Those were the options that they had. Many of them didn't have parents. So instead of, and so they tried to go back to the mines to work, and those mines had armed guards, and those guards used their weaponry against the children. And so this is like a horrific uh, example of where both the NGO that was well-versed and the companies, as well-intended as they were, um, with their supply chains had a bad result. And this is where I think the SDGs come in um, and can really help us in terms of framing, you know, what kind of risks we're looking at is when we look at the SDGs, you know, what, how could we have used that as a framework to avoid that happening? We could have looked at these children, oh, well, instead of, you know, investing in cutting them off in the mines, let's invest in sending them to schools and giving them digital educations, and also training them to work in agriculture, which is safer for them, but yet they can earn the money that they need to eat, and then train the communities on why they need to invest in the future of their children. You know, there are all these options. They're more complex options, but um, they're the ones that we want in, over the longer term value, um, like we're espousing as to the companies that we want to support. So that's an example. And I think that goes back to the notion that we're not in a transactional world. It's not binary and it's not one to one. It's one to many and many to many. So everything that we do has consequences beyond the, um, the, const the primary constituency that we're dealing with. We all hear about all the advantages of IoT and putting sensors everywhere, right? But I don't hear so much about all the electronic waste that it's creating and the consequences of that. People are talking about $5 sensors, $5 things, you know? But then there is not enough emphasis on recycling or even what to do with this electronics. Any thoughts on that or what your companies are doing on that? I can address it if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I totally agree with you.
that um, as we talk about the 50 billion users, um, before we even got on the panel, we were actually comparing like how many um, electronic devices we each brought with <laughs> us, you know? And I counted anything that had a battery in it as an, so I had to count my electric toothbrush too. Um, and we all need to work on this issue, and I'll, I'll tell you why, and it's not solved yet. One is because we are running out of resources, and electronics companies, mobile operators, we need these resources, yet we're running out. So we need to get better at urban mining as opposed to extractive mining, you know. And so we really, and then part of solving that problem relies on changing policy around transboundary movement of e-waste. It, 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 part of the problem is building up our reverse supply chains. Um, none of us would design the reverse supply chain for electronics waste as a business that exists today. There are 900 recyclers in the EU. There are 700 recycling entities in the United States. None of us would design reverse supply chains with that many nodes at all. We wouldn't. So it's up to us to really join together, to work with entities like GSMA, to work together so that we can have the nodes in the collection in a way that's convenient for the consumers. It's easier for enterprise users, of course, but convenient for consumers, for small and large electronics to be collected in a way that's safe, that has the trust in consumers that their data will be wiped appropriately and not misused, and that we can bring in the electronics to nodes and have them be in a place where we can use the raw materials effectively in cross-sector industries like the jewelry industry or the automobile industry, and that we use technology like blockchain to trace that to make sure that the raw materials are pure so they can, they can be reused and reintroduced into the supply chain. We have a long ways to go on doing this, but the solutions and technology exist today for us to begin to address these problems in a way that makes sense. That involves working with the policymakers who have made some of the um, e-recycling laws that we are living with and working with today. I can uh, maybe just extrapolate yes. too, just to say, I mean, mobile networks, it's one of the most ubiquitous technologies, you know, all, all over the world. And so just to, I think, a similar sort of uh, thinking, I mean, Ericsson as a responsible, you know, producer was, you know, at first really thinking about it from the environmental perspective and take, having a, you know, a product take back that we would, you know, responsibly, you know, recycle and reuse and had a very successful program around that. However, uh, you know, the, the truth is that the, the used equipment has a value. And so we have to really evolve from a take back to a buyback and then refurbishment and reuse. And so it is a, a journey to really develop that business model that makes sense for, for all parties. And of course, to continue on that responsible environmental perspective, but that's not the only driver. Yep. And to change I, I consumer to behavior too, to yeah. So can you use a device that has a scratch on it? Do you need to have something that's pristine and, and gorgeous? And can we, um, you know, can we change buyer behavior? So and I would just add, I mean, <laughs> as a purchaser, as a large purchaser of equipment, we have roles to play as well in this. And I think the investment community has actually been playing a much, heightened, a much more heightened role in influencing us to play those roles. Um, you know, we need to be more visible, um, need to be more transparent, I guess is the word, <clears throat> around what our supply chains look like. So that mm -hmm. means mapping our supply chains, making that uh, transparent, reporting on it. It means identifying where the major risks for issues like e-waste are in those supply chains, and it means getting better at the processes that we have in place for managing those risks. Um, companies need to do more assessment of what are the processes they have in place and the policies they have in place and where are the gaps and how can we go on a journey of continuous improvement and take people with us on that journey. It isn't going to be a, a quick fix for all the reasons we've heard, but I think what's important is being more transparent about what that journey is going to look like. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that transparency also can lead to um, inspiration for you as a company to find ways of becoming more efficient even back to your 
um, first answer that you know profitability and and doing good are not separate. Right. There's not a dichotomy. So, you know, you could probably find a lot of efficiencies <laughs> in your supply chain once it becomes really transparent and, and front and center. So all the all the conversation about responsible innovation um, and inclusion by design and all the rest of it, we need to find the right models for showing what impact that creates down the line, both in terms of business value and social value. You know, the social value picture is often, it's also complicated to measure and demonstrate, but it's often there. I think the business value requires time, it requires time to see these models play out, the investment you put in at the front, the returns are much longer return horizons. Um, and so the appetite of business to take that on uh, requires a really good business justification up front, and some of that justification is going to be built on things like um, not, not revenue generation or profit. It's going to be built on things like engaging employees on the importance of these issues or looking at opportunities to innovate for new markets that we don't know about, and so um, we're going to be testing things in this space. It's not the traditional um, business value metrics, and so I think it's a really important question. Um, Breaking through on the social agenda is going to be one of the biggest things I think the whole sustainable business industry um, can do. Thank you for your questions. And I, I know we're way over time, so I, I would like to thank the panelists for joining us. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. It's a great conversation. <laughs>